When you think of Holy Sniper, what comes to mind? Hey guys, I'm Ronan and welcome back to my channel. Today we are talking about a really fun build I'm excited for, the Holy Sniper. Utilizing the CC, support, and some other things that the Cleric gives in combination with just going a few points into Hunter, you had a devastating killing machine. I kid you not, I made a deep Cleric build that does some incredible burst has some out of this world utility in CC, and honestly, might be my favorite build to date. Let's get into it. So how does this build actually work then if you only have one attack? Well, with the War Priest, you have War Priest extra attack charges, allowing you to use a bonus action to attack again. But where the actual burst comes from is going to be from two things. A, you have Divine Strike. And I know what you're thinking, the Vine Strike is a bad rep, right? Well, the Vine Strike, you can do additional damage automatically whenever you attack. There's a ranged version and a melee version. The reason I like this, and even though it's only once per turn because it is a reaction, what you can end up doing is actually combining this with the subclass from the Ranger. With the Ranger subclass, you choose Colossus Slayer. Once per turn, your weapon attacks deal additional 1d8 damage if the target is below its maximum hit point. Because this counts as a separate additional attack, it will automatically proc Colossus Slayer. If you combine that with additional damage from Caustic Ban, combining with the Kalos Glow Ring, it will proc the Glow Ring 3 to 4 times. You have your passive for Sharpshooter for even more damage. And because you are a war priest, even with that negative attack penalty, you can use your channel divinity to give yourself plus 10 to your attack roll, making sure you hit the enemy. If you combine that with some additional gear like the luminous gloves for radiant damage to do radiant orbs, applying reverberation, you can really stack up some damage quickly, debuffs quickly, and in one turn you can get 4 plus stacks of arcane acuity, no issues whatsoever. Alright, so I have a lot of openers that you can do. One thing if you want like maximum burst, you could use your melody, your shriek, get that going. I'm just going to go ahead and cast my spirit guardians real quick. And to turn base mood, and I'm just going to open up on this lady in front of me here. I accidentally one shot her. I, I didn't mean to actually do that. You can see that was a lot of damage. You have your 34 piercing and that's with sharpshooter on. The extra lightning because the drakes threw my acid damage from the ring, which procced the radiant damage from the other ring. You have your additional hit here, which procs the ring again. Then you have Colossus Slayer which procs the ring again. And because your Divine Strike counts as an additional attack, it will always proc Colossus Slayer, so anytime you attack, it procs both, which is really, really powerful. So now that it's my turn, I have a couple of things I can do. So what I'm going to do is A, I could either knock all these guys asleep, which wouldn't be a bad idea. I could definitely do that. So let's go ahead and do sleep real quick. That way I can kind of just, you know, CC everyone if I wanted to. And you can see I have three stacks of acuity just from that one attack, by the way. They're all asleep. Fantastic, because now I can use my bonus action and summon a spirit weapon. I could go trident, maul. I'm going to go with the maul here and summon him right there. I'm going to try to get out of line of sight so the guy doesn't hit me and just end my turn. Alright, so it's my turn. Let's go ahead and try to knock him. 
The custom smash failed, which is unfortunate. It would have been nice since he has a lot of dexterity, but that's okay. Perfect. All right, so now that's my turn. Another good opener is if you know for sure you are going to open up on everyone, you could easily get your Guardian of Faith going right away. So I'm going to put Guardian of Faith right here in the middle. Come up. And I'm going to daze this guy right here. And I'm just going to end my turn. And the way this build works is you want to be positioned near your Guardian of Faith. That way, if you have melee attackers attack, you can force them to come to you and take damage from your Spirit Guardians plus your Guardian of Faith. Or you can easily pull them towards you with your weapon once you get it in Act 3. And what's great is if they attack you while you're at your Guardian of Faith, he reacts and attacks them. So now that it's my turn, I could either attack, which would be a smart thing to do, because all these guys you can see are pretty much at max HP. So that's what I'm going to do. Let's go ahead and attack you in the back. You can see all the radiant orbs and reverberation I just did to that person. So now I'm going to go ahead and attack this one here. Did some damage, and I'm going to walk up and kill that way, and I'll end my turn. I could shield blow, but it's probably not going to happen. They have a pretty good save, so I'm not even going to bother about it. But you could use that as a reaction if you wanted, for example. As you can see, they pass, so they didn't do anything, but they have the ability to retaliate as well. Alright, so I have my little hammer again. He missed, but that's okay. He's more so for extra CC and to distract enemies. So, what if I wanted to pull them to me? So I'm going to pull him. He's got a 75% chance to get pulled to me, and that's what I'm going to do. If I got pulled to me, I'm going to use a bonus action here because I'm a little low, so I definitely want to heal some. I'm actually going to heal a lot. Even though I normally wouldn't upcast it this much, I'm a little low, so let's try to heal some. Not that much, but it's enough to where I won't die. I walk into him, he dies. And I could have easily summoned a guardian there if I wanted to, but there wasn't a need in my opinion. Oh, he had nowhere to go. He got hit. Shame. So no matter what, this guy's going to die on my turn coming up. So it's just a matter of how do I want to kill him. So I could run up, hit him that way, pull him towards me. There's a bunch of different things I could do. We're just going to go ahead and like I could rush attack as well if I needed to get across, which is really cool. In order to dash at the enemy. And you can see that will also get all the radiant damage itself as well, which is really fun. And that's how you play the build. I mean... I'm not sure how to explain it any other way than you kind of like set up a, a home base, you let enemies come to you, or you come to them, you can shoot enemies from afar, you can pull with reposition. It's really, really fun, and just by switching out a few pieces of gear, you can become more defensive. For example, if I switch out these gloves, if I don't need radiant orbs, and I want reviving hands instead, I can give myself blade ward anytime I heal. 
I take out the caustic band and I add the whispering promise. Anytime I heal, I also give bless. There's a lot of different things you can do with this build. If you don't care about having the pull from this weapon, you can replace this with like the legendary bow, for example, to do even more burst and add guiding bolts as well when hit. It's insane the amount of different stuff you can do. If you have a stronger one-hander that is also finesse, your melee attacks hit pretty hard. It's really, really fun. I enjoy the heck out of it. All right, everyone, it is time to talk gear. Starting out, I do want to state I have different gear depending on the type of situation I want to be in. Do I want to be more supportive? Do I want to be more bursty? Do I want to like an in-between? I got you covered. And what's great is majority of this gear I use, you get in Act 1 and 2. Some of it obviously is from Act 3, but a lot of it is in the earlier stages of the game. So let's talk end game with weapons first, and then I'll talk about what you can use for Acts 1 and 2. So end game, in my opinion, there's going to be two to three bows you really want to use. The Hellfire Engine Crossbow that you get at the Steelworks, and I'll showcase a tutorial at the end of the video on how to get this. This is amazing because this will give you an ability to pull enemies to you. And that ability is from the weapon itself. You can read it. It is the Reposition Malfactor. What determines the DC for this? I don't know. The combat log is really glitched. It says it does like spell casting modifier, but even with all my extra spell DC, it doesn't affect it. So I'm pretty sure this is a bug right now and not programmed correctly on what DC is actually saved with it. But this is really great because this will pull enemies literally 30 feet. That's great because you have abilities like your spirit guardians that you can, you know, the AOE field around you, you can pull enemies to you. You can pull them into your actual like big time guardian guy, the guardian of faith. It's really, really strong. And honestly, it's just nice to pull enemies down too. You have an archer from above, pull them down to you. It's a really great weapon. It's a heavy crossbow as well. So it's 1d10 plus your modifier. It's really, really strong. I like this a lot. If you don't use this in Act 3, of course, you have the Legendary Bow. This thing is just, I mean, it's in a class of its own when it comes to stuff. It has a really nice ability, Bolt of Celestial Light. You can use this once per short rest, but once you do, all of your attacks will do additional radiant damage afterwards. So if you use this, you do not want to use any spell that puts radiant damage on your bow, because if it does, it overrides it. So keep that in mind. But if you use this and then don't use any spell like Crusader's Mantle, for example, you don't have to use Crusader's Mantle because you can use this and then your bow attacks will always do additional radiant damage. And if you add the Drake Throat like ability to where you can add additional stuff on your weapons, it's really insane. If you don't know how the Drake Throat works, check the video down below in the description. It's a great way to add extra attack and damage to any weapon of your choice. So this thing is ridiculous though, because it also gives you haste, which is really nice once per long rest. On hit, you can actually just give Guiding Bolt, which is absolutely insane, really, really strong. And it does an AOE light field around you. This bow is just really, really good. And the best part about it is you can get this bow in the same area you go to get the Hellfire bow as well. So you can pick and choose what you want. The third option for bow, in my opinion, would definitely be the dead shot. However, I like having this with more of my crit based characters, but this is also another great bow to use. And the dead shot will help out when it comes to actually hitting the enemy more than the other bows will. I just really like the utility this offers to pull enemies to me into my spells. So with that being said, what about Axe 1 and 2? Well, there's going to be two bows, in my opinion, that you should use a you have the titan string bow this thing will give you additional damage equal to your strength modifier i know what you're thinking but your strength is only eight right well if you have the club of hill giant strength it automatically sets it to 19 so i could put that on you'll be at 19 strength giving you a modifier of plus four adding plus four to the damage if you use this bow and all the items i showcase in this video if i didn't mention it already Check the description down below. I have itemization videos already made that talk about where to get all this stuff at. 
The other bow is the Herald Bow. You get this from the same quest that you need to complete in order to unlock the vendor for the Titan String Bow. This is great because this means literally anytime you attack the enemy, they have to pass a check or they become beamed, meaning they have negative four or a negative D4 to their attack rules. Really, really strong if you want to help kind of like debuff the enemy. So these are my two bows I would recommend for Acts 1 and 2. And once you get to Act 3, upgrade to something else. All right. So what about melee weapons and stuff? So obviously we're going to be having a shield in our offhand. I find the Catherick shield just to be super good. Advantage on dexterity saving throw checks is really, really nice. Plus you get a plus one bonus to your spell save DC and attack rolls. This is one of my favorite shields in the game. This is the one I use. So use this as soon as you get it. Other than that, use whatever shield you want until then. When it comes to your melee weapon, we already talked about the Club of the Hill Giant Strength, but for X 1, 2, and 3, there's other choices. You could use the Aluv. This thing is amazing. With the Shriek ability you have from the Melody, you can just do an AoE extra like uh, thunder damage. Really, really powerful if you want extra burst. If you want extra summons, the Infernal Rapier is really nice because then you get the Cambion summon once per long rest. So it's just extra damage for free. And it will give you plus one to your spell save DC and use your spell DC for your attack rolls instead, which is really nice. Even though you only have 16 wisdom, it won't matter because you have so much spell save DC by the time you get this anyway. It's really powerful. And you want it more so for the summon regardless. Of course, if you want to be more supporty, you have the legendary mace for leveling up cleric and then respecking. This thing's okay. It just has a really nice class ability once per long rest to do like AUE healing. Of course, you have the blood of Lathander. Everyone knows how great this is. You have knife of the Undermountain King. Whatever melee weapon you want, it's going to be up to you. For extra burst though, the Aluv is probably one of the best. But I do want to give the shout out to the Infernal Rapier. The free Cambion is really nice too. Okay, so with weapons, shields, and stuff out of the way, it's time to talk about the rest of the gear. So my helm is the Helmet of Arcane Acuity. In my opinion, this is the only helm you're going to use. You get this in Act 2. This is amazing because after one hit, with the way this build is set up, I will have four stacks of Arcane Acuity from one hit really really strong any other helm before then feel free to use but as soon as you can get this get it my cape i like cloak of displacement making the enemies have disadvantage to attack me is really really strong plus it looks really sick in my opinion if you don't like using this then in my opinion cloak of protection is also very good extra ac extra saving throws if you want more spell save dc cloak of the weave Pick what you want here. Chest piece, I'm going with the Dark Justice Year's Half Plate. Obviously, there's a better version of this if you chose the not so nice option in Act 2. Uh, but this gives you advantage on Constitution saving throw checks, which is the only reason I use it, because a lot of the spells you use as this build are concentration spells. So I have it, and I think with the die I used, it looks really, really cool. Alright, so now we talk about the gloves luminous gloves you get these in act two whenever you deal radiant damage you get one turn of radiating orbs this thing is amazing one of the best gloves in the game for this build because the way it interacts with your gear later on you can get basically three to four sacks of radiant orbs from one attack really really nice if you would prefer to be more supportive instead though there's some other options you can use so very early on, if you just want extra damage for your bow, you can get the Gloves of Archery. This will give you plus two damage for your bows. Okay, pretty cool. If you want a little bit more support, you have the Reviving Hands. Whenever you heal, you give Blade Ward, which is really great. And there is a version of these gloves that aren't as good that you can actually get from Zevlar in Act 1. As soon as you actually run into Emerald Grove, talk to him. As soon as you have the option to trade with him, you can buy the green version of these gloves that have the same effect. When you heal someone, they get blade ward. Really, really powerful if you want to be a little bit more supportive. 
Other than that, those are the only gloves I use. I do want to give a shout out though to the Legacy of the Masters. If you did want extra hit and damage in Act 3, you can buy these from Damon. Not a bad pair of gloves to have. Okay, so then that's going to lead us to the boots. These are my go-to boots. Whenever you inflict the condition, you inflict two turns of reverberation. Reverberation is a debuff that you can read here. They get negative one to their dex, strength, and constitution saving throws, and it stacks. At once they hit five, they have to make a check, and if they fail, they get knocked prone and take lightning damage or thunder damage. This is really nice because every attack you do is going to apply a radiant orb because you do radiant damage with your attacks because of a certain ring you will, will be using or if you just use any of your spells. So no matter what, when you attack, you do damage, you put radiant orbs, reverberation, you do a lot just from one hit. That brings us to necklaces. So Act 3, Amulet of the Devout is the go-to necklace you will be using. You get plus two to your spell save DC. That alone is great. But you also have an additional charge for your divine charge here. So your guiding strike that you have, your channel of the divinity. Normally you would only have two charges. Well, you have three now with this build, which is really cool. Any necklace before then that you want to use, feel free to use. This is the one you use as soon as you get to act three. Rings. So there's going to be quite a few different rings you can use. Caustic Band is just kind of like a default free pick. It's extra damage. And with the way this works, this will proc the Kalos Glow Ring for extra uh, radiant damage on the enemy, which is really nice. The Kalos Glow Ring is really good because pretty much everything you attack is going to be illuminated because you're going to be applying radiant orbs to people. And one of the easiest way to do that is your level one spell slot. And you can start doing this pretty much as soon as you get the gear because you'll have your spell divine favor so you can channel a spell to do ra uh, radiant damage to the enemy anyway so with the caustic ban and that combined you know it's just you're gonna proc extra Kalos glow ring procs all the time so the Kalos glow ring is the one ring i would say you can never get rid of because it kind of makes the build sync together with how the gear works but if you don't want to use the caustic ban another really great ring here is the strange conduit ring because majority of the spells you'll be using are concentration spells. This is nice because that means you just do extra 1d4 psychic, which is pretty cool. If you prefer to be a little bit more supportive, instead of the caustic ban or that ring we just talked about, the whispering promise that you get in act one that you can buy from Volo. Literally, as soon as you see Volo in Emerald Grove, you can buy this. Whenever you heal a target, they gain bless 1d4 to their attack rolls and saving throws for two turns. This, plus the other supportive gloves we talked about, the reviving hands, and the version you can buy from Zevlar in Act 1, anytime you heal, blade board, and bless. And what's great is your bonus action. You have a bonus action to heal in AoE. You can heal up to six allies at once, or a bonus action just to heal one person at once. It's really, really strong. So if you want to be supportive, you have that option there. If you want extra damage, you have that option there as well. And that's pretty much the gear I use for this build. Could you make it better? Yeah, I guess you could. I mean, technically, you have access to heavy plate if you did want to use heavy plate. I just like having advantage on constitution saving throws. And this is when the hag's hair would really make the build even stronger. Because if you did use the hag's hair, you could get the 20 dexterity with only one ASI. And then use that last feat to maybe gain proficiency with constitution saving throws or something else. But it's going to be up to you and how you build it. But this is how I did gear. So let's talk about leveling. All right, guys, if you made it to the end of this video, it's time to talk about leveling individually from 1 to 12. That way, if you did want to follow this from a brand new file, you certainly can. Your choices are to start out as a war cleric or a ranger. My preference is war cleric personally, because I do find what you need from them is going to override what you need from a ranger. But it's going to be up to you if you would like to go ranger first. There isn't going to be that much difference. So when it comes to my starting stats, 17 dex, constitution 15, wisdom 16. I do not utilize the hag's hair. So obviously if you do have the hag's hair, you can make this build even better. If you start out with this build and you're using it for our good old favorite shadow heart here, 
keep in mind you will have to respec because she starts out in the trickery domain and you need to be war domain. So starting out, you do get some spells like Divine Favor. This is nice just to give your attacks extra holy damage. Cantrip wise, pick what you want. I think Sacred Flame is kind of bad, but it's nice to have in a pinch if you do need it for whatever reason. Background, I just went with the default history and medicine. Depending on your race and what background you choose as a custom character, you may have different options. Alright, so Cleric level 2, this is when you get your Divine Channel of Divinity here. As a War Priest, it's Guided Strike. Basically, you can give yourself plus 10 to your attack rolls as a reaction, so if you were to miss normally, now you don't. You get some features, Channel Divinity Charges, it's only 1, but it will increase as you level up more. You get some spell casting, and you can turn Undead by using a Channel Divinity Charge as well. Spell-wise, starting spells out, so I do want to state there are some spells early on that are going to be really powerful. So in my opinion, Bless early on is really good, but may not necessarily be needed depending on what gear you use early on. Cure Wounds, it's an action to use during combat. I don't like using actions strictly for healing. I find Healing Word to be a lot better because it's a bonus action, and this can be utilized to help pretty much bring a downed uh, teammate back up which is really nice the guiding bolt is very useful early on this is going to be really nice if you have teammates that need to attack especially if they have great weapon master they'll have advantage so this is really good i find create water is really really nice if you play with other characters that utilize lightning or cold magic this is really great for that and once you get to a higher level even your own magic can utilize this as well Inflict Wounds is okay. I don't utilize it all that much, but it can hit pretty hard when you upcast it, so keep that in mind. And it's a melee kind of action, so if anyone is up in your face and you can't get away, this is a good way to do damage to them. Bane, pretty terrible. Don't use it. And of course, Sanctuary, one of the best spells in the game. You can cast this on yourself or on a friend, and enemies cannot hit them directly, but they can get hit with AoE still. Pretty much means, for most cases, if you put this on someone, they're going to be good to go. So the last spell, pick whatever you want. Command is also pretty useful, but I find the later on in the game, the less I use this. At level 4, you get your first feat. We're going Ability Improvement, and we're going Dexterity 18, Constitution 16 in order to get a higher modifier. Cantrip, go ahead and pick what you didn't pick already. Prepared Spells. You can add more spells or change them around if you want. Hold Person is pretty good, so I would definitely say use this if you don't have someone else that already has it in your party. Cleric level 5. So this is when things are really going to start to get fun because this is when you unlock a few new abilities. So let's start with the War Cleric specifically. You're going to have Spirit Guardians always prepared. You, this is the AoE like Necrotic or Radiant damage around your character. Really, really strong concentration spell though and then crusader's mantle this is like the other spell you get it's just for being a war cleric early on except it affects allies as well so you can use this to increase your own damage and allies damage too but there's another spell i want to point out glypho warding really really strong does great aoe you can sleep you can knock back if you had to target wet already you could use like the lightning field it's really really strong and i like it a lot this is becoming one of my favorite spells in the game. Also, destroy undead. So if you did happen to turn undead, well, whenever you turn them, they take radiant damage now as well. With you being level 5, you should be close into Act 2. So basically, if you're not at Act 2 yet, you're going to be pretty soon, most likely. And that's when clerics are really going to do really good damage and start to shine. All right, Cleric level six, this is when your actual divine charge gets better because now you can use it on allies. So not only can you increase your own attack roll by plus 10, but you can use a reaction to increase plus 10 for a teammate. So any teammates that have great weapon master as a feat, for example, this pretty much will negate that for them. It's really, really powerful. And you get some more charges for your channel of divinity as well, which is nice. Spell-wise here, go ahead and put down the spells that you want to have in your party. I do want to give a shout out to Mass Healing Word. 
it's just healing word but better because it affects multiple allies and if you use this with some of the utility stuff we talked about earlier gear wise you can give your entire team bless as a bonus action for two turns really good stuff all right cleric level seven so the reason i'm going to point this out is because you get guardian of faith so we are definitely putting that on we don't need remove curse you can prepare that anytime you need it to remove a curse we want guardian of faith this thing hits really really hard i like it a lot and once you get the ability to pull enemies towards you and you'll know what i'm talking about from the intro this is really fun cleric level eight this is the final cleric level you're actually going to take as this build this gives you divine strike and i know divine strike gets a lot of hate however once you multi-class into hunter this is going to actually be amazing because with hunter once you actually get to that point you'll be able to do all kinds of additional damage from one hit and as a war priest you can use your war priest charges using a bonus action to attack again anyway so you don't need extra attack as his build and with this even though it says melee there is a ranged option you're going to start hitting really hard now you also get your second feet here so you could either go ability improvement now if you want to get dexterity to max or you can come down and get your good old sharpshooter sharpshooter it's a great weapon master but for ranged weapons you take a negative five penalty to your attack rolls but if you hit you do plus 10 damage and with having guiding strike to give yourself plus 10 to your attack rolls this is pretty powerful but at the same time sharpshooter low ground basically normally if you were to shoot someone that's at higher ground you would be at disadvantage well no longer the case you will never have that again so this is a really great feat to get either now or once you get the max level it's going to be up to you on how you play what difficulty you're on and whatever you want to do but no matter what it's going to be sharpshooter or asi at this point all right so we're no longer going cleric we are now going into ranger so by this point you're going to be in act two for sure i was close to level 11 when i left act two but that was also with me pretty much getting as much experience as i can and doing everything throughout act one and act two so i would say when it comes to their favorite enemy you have a couple of choices you could either go bounty hunter keeper of the veil and that's it the reason i say don't go ranger knight is because you already have access to heavy armor because you are a war priest so you get that automatically you don't need sanctified stalker i mean you could already have access to this regardless this cantrip so you don't need that mage breaker is <laughs> the worst choice ever this cantrip right here true strike is garbage don't pick it keeper of the veil is okay i mean protection from good and evil i've never used it in this game ever so if it is good and i'm not utilizing it then definitely let me know uh, but in my opinion bounty hunter is probably the best choice here just because it will help you out slightly depending on how you play and then of course your other things you can choose here beast tamer if you do want a fine familiar these are really really useful and can really help distract uh, enemies other than that i mean urban tracker is okay i don't use this character to steal but if you do that could be something or you could take wasteland wanderer fire in my opinion fire is one of the most common uh like magic types in the game so having resistance to this now is good especially in act three there's a lot of fire in act three with certain enemies that you fight so this would be nice to have as well abilities here you can add abilities to things so if you want extra perception this is really good athletics is okay depending on gear you don't need that though so it's going to be up to you on what you want to choose here i personally go with perception all right so level 10 ranger level 2 you get some spells so spells i would recommend long strider such a great utility spell free movement for you and every one of your allies until your next long rest it's a ritual spell so it's free really powerful if you want enhanced sleep another great ritual spell to have or if you want ensnaring strike i don't use ensnaring strike much at all but it can have some niche uses it's going to be up to you i don't use hunter's mark at all as this build i feel like there's no need fighting style you can finally pick archery now 
All right, you finally get your subclass, and now this is when you should be in Act 3, because you'll be level 11 now. And this is when your damage is going to pop off big time. So you're going Hunter, you're doing Hunter's Prey, and you're doing Colossus Slayer. Well, this stacking with the extra attack you get just from being a War Priest and everything else, like you're going to be doing a lot of damage with this with the way those two subclass features kind of work together. Which is why I didn't want you to take Colossus Slayer right away. I felt like there was no point to take it right away if you couldn't hit the enemy with additional damage. Well, now you will no matter what. So it's really strong. Spell-wise, go ahead and pick whatever you want here. It's going to be up to you. Alright, and then your final feat, Ability Improvement. And now you're done level. 